Ten years ago this month, on June 29, 2007, iPhone was released. Within just three months, Apple had sold one million iPhones. Now, a decade later, more than 1.2 billion phones have been um, sold. How did iPhone come to be? Tonight, four members of the original development team will discuss that uh, Apple secret project, which in the past decade has remade the computer industry, changed the business landscape, and become a tool in the hands of more than a billion people around the world. This program is part of iPhone 360, led by the Exponential Sear Center here at the museum. And the goal of that is really to do what we do here at the museum, to explore and tell the story of transformational technology and how it's affecting all of our lives through technology, through business, and through social impact. And in the spirit of that 360 approach, we're telling it from many people's voices, uh, from many perspectives. And we hope that the setup tonight in this 360 in the round, that perhaps you'll hear the stories tonight and think about this story from a new perspective. Throughout the year, we've been exploring this iPhone 360, not only through public events, this is the third or fourth in the series, but also through collections, through artifacts, through oral histories, developing new research, uh, creating a new exhibit, uh, and uh, publishing insights and creating new educational materials. That's at the heart of the mission of the museum. If you're a part of the story and can help us capture the story of iPhone or tell it, um, please be sure to contact me or a part of our curatorial team. Many of them are standing in the back. We have an amazing team of curators and project members that would love to talk with you. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for tonight's program titled, Putting Your Finger on It, Creating iPhone. First, John Markoff, who will lead tonight's conversations. John was a Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, journalist at New York Times, where he covered business and technology, and uh, has been a well-respected uh, author on several books. At the beginning of the year, he joined us here at the Computer History Museum as a historian, and he's a member of the iPhone Project. Please give John a warm round of applause. Thank you. Our first panelist, and to introduce our panelists, I'll bring up uh, five numbers. 1985 was the year he launched his first startup in the UK. 12 was the number of phones that he owned in just three years before joining Apple. 120 million, the number of iPhones manufactured during his tenure as hardware manager. Five, the number of years he worked at Apple and 27, the number of hours he spent on his longest day in the factory. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming to the stage, Hugo Fines. <laughs> so glad to have you here. Good. And for our next guest, 10 was the age when he first used an Apple computer. Three was the number of platforms that Apple supported in 1993, his first year at the company. 19, the number of years he worked at Apple. 17, continuous years running the pre-release operating systems at Apple. <laughs> and 30 plus, the number of operating systems released that he contributed while at Apple. Please join me in welcoming Neeton Ganatra. <laughs> Thank you so much, Neeton. Thank you. And now to round out our panel, 10 was the grade in which he made his first software demonstration. 110, the highest speed in frames per second contacts could scroll on the original iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> 16 years at Apple and 58 seconds, it was less than a minute, 58 seconds, the fastest time code turnaround during a human interface review. <laughs> And about 45, the number of amazing teammates he said he was privileged to work for, work with, and platform experience. Please join me in welcoming Scott Hurst. Thanks, Scott. Hey. In 1991, uh, Mark Weiser, who was then a computer scientist at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center, published an article in Scientific American in which he argued that Computing was beginning or was about to disappear into everyday devices and they would become magic. 
And for me at that time, it was both an alluring and really foreign idea because I was just getting used to the last big concept in computing, which was that computers would become personal. Um, the, the, the sort of the best example at that point was an idea that had been created by another Xerox computer scientist, Alan Kay, the Dynabook, and the idea was that you would have one computer for one person. And um, all of a sudden, computers were about to go away. But like the Dynabook, which preceded the first useful com you know, portable personal computers, it was about 15 years. And the same thing ended up being true with this idea of ubiquitous computing. It took about 15 years. And I'd sort of like to make the argument that it was the iPod, in which a microprocessor disappeared into a music player, and then the iPhone, in which a phone was blended with a microprocessor and it became magic, were the sort of first two successful um, examples of this new um, era of ubiquitous computing that we're deeply into now. Um, so with that in mind, let's explore how it came to be. And I'd like to start um, by asking you guys uh, about, there's sort of a tale of, of uh, which I guess I'd call the invasion of the body snatchers, about how this got going. And I'd, I'd like to... Um, uh, have each of you describe how you came to the iPhone project. Um, how were you recruited in? Um, how did each of you arrive at? Hugo, do you want to do you want to start? I, I, they had a couple of attempts um, in in 2004. I came over to the US and interviewed, and they wouldn't tell me what I was working on, which is quite normal. Um, uh, uh, and I, I decided no, I, I wasn't going to do it. That two years later, they came back. And said, so it's really cool this time, <laughs> really cool. Um, but they couldn't tell me what it was until I left my country, left the UK, moved to the US, signed another NDA. Um, uh, and I, I was very glad I'd done that. I, I, but it was, it was... Uh, was that a big deal? Did you, was it, I mean... It, it was, was a big deal leaving the country, yeah. Uh, and coming work on a project that I didn't know what it was going to be. I'm pretty sure it wasn't going to be a photocopier, but... <laughs> um, I, we, we, we interview, when you're interviewed a lot of ex-Motorola people, it's like, huh, huh, radio, huh, hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, everyone had been talking about phones. They'd, you know, they'd been the rumors for years. You were a processor guy at this point. Um, no, I was uh, actually an MP3 player guy, actually, but competing with iPod. So, you know, I, was, I, was, <laughs> I had a startup in 98, was acquired by Rio, and, you know, I'd actually met Tony Fidel, I think, in, like, 2003. Okay. Um, we had a technology meeting about Apple maybe buying some IP from us, and that's how we, and it was just like, oh, him. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's how they kept on calling me. So I was lucky I, I did actually say yes, otherwise. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Nitan, how did you, how did you get recruited in? Um, so I had already uh, been working at Apple for 11 or 12 years by then. Uh, I was working in the operating systems group, uh, and I was managing the, the mail and address book teams for Mac OS X. And it was just a just matter of course, just sort of during the day, we would talk about electronic products that were out there. And, you know, this is early 2000s. And uh, there, there was some development happening on, on phones. And anytime somebody, somebody uh, received a new phone or something like that, we'd pull it out and play with it and look at what was neat and look at what was terrible. And a lot of it was more terrible than neat. Um, so we just had these hallway conversations. Uh, it, and, and it just so happened that Scott Forstall was in the office next to me. Uh, so he would participate in these conversations as well. I'm not, I haven't heard from Scott. I, I, I'm not sure how much that played into what would happen later. Uh, but, but one day Scott did walk into my office, close the door behind him, and, uh, and said, we're, we're going to be starting this new phone project. Uh, how would you like to give up managing the mail and address book teams and, and uh, manage uh, the the, the uh, software part of, uh, of, of this phone thing. Uh, and it was, I, I mean, it was kind of a, I mean, it was both terrifying and it was also uh, uh, amazing all at the same time. Did you make the decision on the spot? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yes, yes. I made the decision right on the spot. Yeah, it was not but a We played it cool, like, <laughs> don't say yes right away, but. Like. And did you disappear? Is that the right way to describe it? Uh, several days later, or a couple of weeks later, something like that. It, it, yes, we, well, first of all, I mean, and I think Scott can probably tell this story a little bit more. Um, well, I was in the office next to him, oh, so, so. <laughs> <laughs> after I think he went to your office, then, you know, very quickly, you know, 
hey, you know, come and talk to me or whatever. Come, come to my office, whatever. And we'd kind of, yeah, we'd kind of like been talking about, oh, maybe there's something kind of cool going on. And I'd been on a dress book, and one of the things that we'd, a feature that we'd done for that is like we had these like little, the Bluetooth connection to the, you know, the crummy little right. candy bar phones that you had. And so we had piles of those, usually from like, Europe always had the best ones, like our phones in this country weren't anything to like get excited about. And so when Scott was like, so what do you like about your job? I made sure to be like, well, these phones, you know, I think there's a lot we could, you know, we could do some pretty cool stuff with these phones. And then it was like, well, maybe you would want to do this. And I was like, absolutely so want to do this. Where did you go to? Where did you disappear to? So, so I think it, was, it must have been a week later or something like that. Small number of days later, we, we moved our, our offices. Uh, Scott and I and two other guys, Greg and uh, Virgil, Virgil uh, from the... Uh, from the mail team as well, we all moved up to the human interface hallway. Yeah. So we were in the, in the, uh, sitting across and, and next to uh, the human interface designers. Um, and what we didn't, what I didn't know before that was that, I mean, obviously they had been working on these projects. They, they work on lots of stuff, so you know, it's not a big surprise that they're working on more than what we knew about. But lo and behold, they had this, you know, they, they had this Macintosh that was hooked up to a tablet-like device and a big thick cable between the two and uh, and that was where we saw the first designs was, uh, that, that's where I saw the first designs was, was uh, on this Macintosh with this prototype tablet uh, hooked up to it. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and the funny thing is that those first designs look an awful lot like what the rest of the world eventually saw. I mean, there were a lot of changes and a lot of churn in between there, but. But it had that thing where it was carried. like, you know, the, the scrolling contact stuff that, that Boss did where it's just like, we just sat there like, like gaping idiots just bouncing this thing because it just like it just felt so good and you knew like when you saw it that like I, I mean I imagine this is like what people say like oh well you saw this and you knew everything was going to be that way and like I feel like when we saw that it was just like 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 this is what I, this is how everything is going to be and I if I can do something to help bring it into this world then I want to so that was 2005 yeah yes yeah okay Okay, so before we go too far, I want to ask each of you how you got into computing. Yeah, there, I think there's some interesting stories. Behind. I was a huge nerd, so um, <laughs> um, nobody, el nobody else would have me, so it was like, you know. No, what was my deal? Like, I think what I think was cool is like when I was, I was in the fourth grade, we had like an Apple II, and I was like, you know, really was into that and stuff. And I, I remember having to fill out these like three by five cards of like, well, what are you going to do from your 20s to 30s? Or what are you going to do from your whatever? <laughs> and it was like, I remember from like my 20s to 30s, I was like supposed to be at Apple. And so. This is before the Mac. This is this Apple This is the fourth TV. grade. Uh, yeah, what did I have? I had my first Mac was like a Mac Plus that my dad's office partner had to give up because he had, I don't know, he had something where basically couldn't have it at work because it was like an OSHA hazard. And so they brought it home to me. <laughs> <laughs> Nitan, how did you get into computing? Uh, I, too, was a huge nerd. <laughs> uh, I, I, it was just something that had interested me uh, fr from the first time I saw a, an Apple II Plus. Uh, and, you know, and these, these awful, now awful games, like I think there was one called Trek and some, some other games that, that uh, you know, it started with games. And then, eventually, and then over time it turned into, well, how, how, how do you actually make a game? Like, how do you... You know, did, did somebody sit down and really write this all in this basic thing that, you know, seems to be good for printing my name across the screen, but really, did people write games in this? And so, I mean, I, I think that that sort of piqued the curiosity was, you know, starting with the games and then going into basic and then learning assembly and, and just sort of learning a little bit more about, how, you know, how the Apple II actually worked behind the, behind the scenes. Did you try to write games? Uh, I didn't really write anything of, of, you know, of interest back then. I, you know, I wrote, I, you know, I wrote some small tools here and there to help me out, you know, with, uh, yeah, you know, like Spanish vocabulary, you know, that kind of thing, or, you, you know, just little things here and there, but nothing of consequence. Hugo? Obviously, I was a huge nerd as well. Um, <laughs> I, I was, like, maybe disadvantaged. You know, I, I grew up in rural Somerset in southwest England, a dairy farming area. Um, my father worked for Clark's Shoes. They had an ICL mainframe, and I, I got to walk through the computer room with clearly marked exits in case the argon fire suppression came on. Um, but uh, we didn't have a computer, so, so my, my dad would borrow a Commodore PET and monochrome one. And what I remember was it was an 8032 with a proper keyboard. But when I was typing in the games from magazines, all those funny little graphic symbols aren't labeled on the business keys. Mm. So I had to learn which function key to get like the half 
diagonal. Mm -hmm. You know, so I mean, I, I got into it like that. Um, and you know, pretty soon, but my dad was easily persuaded on computers. So when the BBC came out, uh, the, the Acorn BBCB, uh, we went to buy just the BBC. We ended up getting disk drives and a monitor, so I was just like in heaven. Yeah. Um, but uh, it started off with that, and I was a, a big Acorn nerd all the way through. So you know, the first ARM processors and, and stuff. I wrote the first Sound Tracker player on the ARM processor, which is uh, I was an Amiga guy before that, so it was cool. Yeah. But uh, it, you know, it was it was a uh, it, yeah, I think m most people have the same stories about computing, really. It's just mine are in hypercard, though. They're not as, like, you know. <laughs> so, so not as, mine were in hypercard. They're not as legit real as, you know, yeah. picking, peeking and poking it, like, you know. I, I want to ask a little bit more about the secrecy involved in the, in the iPhone project. When you guys were in, what was it like outside when you went to dinner with friends, or how, how awkward was it? Friends. For you? No, no, sorry. <laughs> dinner out. That's, what, that happened, right? What was his dinner you speak of? <laughs> that, those were all in 2007, right? After the dinners with Let's, friends. No, that yeah. period between 2005 and 2007. How hard was it? To people, I mean, the thing about Apple is, like, people, they, we all get it. We all live in that culture, and we understand it, and we respect it, and it's kind of not a cool thing to be like, oh, tell me whatever thing you're doing. And so I don't know that... People do we were working on something cool, and they would kind of give you maybe a hard time about that, but they were very respectful. I don't ever felt, feel like I got like pressure to yeah. leak something to them. It's, it's interesting. You start to, one of the things I noticed was you develop a talent for yeah. describing something that you're working on without too many specifics, yeah. without giving, giving away you know, too, many, too many details, right? And so you can, I mean, there are multiple ways you can you know, tell the same story, and you can deep dive into, you know, well, these phone calls didn't work, or, you know, this text, <laughs> this entry wasn't in the database, and who the hell knows what's going on. Or you can just sort of say, well, we're adding some data to the database, and this thing isn't not, doing the thing that working. the thing is supposed to. So then if thing. somebody's paying attention, they may go, hmm, you're using a database. <laughs> that doesn't, it doesn't really it. Tell, him, tell him anything, you know. Uh, my sense is that you did better than many other Apple projects. I mean, now, today, it seems like everything Ap Apple does leaks. And it I think it's bigger. I mean, is my memory right yeah. that you did pretty well uh, keeping a lid on things? In, in hardware, we were all in one corridor, purple, right. purple corridor in the bottom floor of Mariani. Yeah. And, and, you know, there were like 15 people tops in there yeah. doing that stuff. Uh, there was no one. There was no one to talk to, and it was everyone was like, "You didn't want to let anyone down. You knew everyone personally." Right. Yeah. You and didn't you're not going to be, be that guy. And you're not going to be simply. You know those people. If you leak it, like, then you're screwing your buddy over, and like, it's not something you want to do. So. Yeah. D d purple was that the code name of the original project? And does anybody remember where the? I mean, there's been a little bit of discussion oh. recently about kangaroos and. Not a kangaroo. Parks. Not a kangaroo. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't aardvark? Know. Wasn't, wasn't there an aardvark at some That's point? That's the radar. So the radar icon, I mean, there's the radar icon, which is an aardvark anteater guy. He eats bugs, right? And then I want to say, I don't know, Andre, didn't you do the simulator icon? <laughs> Sorry. Did I say Andre? He's not here. Um, the, uh, there, was a, there was a wallaby. The, there's a wallaby, which kind of looks like a kangaroo, I guess, that was purple but I think they're kind of unrelated. I would ask your follow-on guest, maybe, if yeah. he knows like, <laughs> where that came on. So I, I also want to ask about the, the sort of the competitive terrain that was out there while you guys were involved in the project, because I, w I spent a fair amount of time in 2006 in Europe, and I had this real sense that, that, that innovation was shifting in terms of mobile computing, particularly to Europe. It really felt like, for the first time, Silicon Valley might miss the next turn. And then all of a sudden the iPhone happened and everything reset and the thing came, came, came back. What did the comp competitive terrain look like? I, I, it was, wasn't, didn't the rocker happen in like 2000? <laughs> he doesn't mean it, it's okay. So th okay, okay, that's not true. Okay. I, 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 let's, let's, so there was Palm, there was Blackberry, there was Symbian, there was some Japanese, uh, variety of Japanese things. Um, did you feel urgency? Did, it, did you feel like, you know, if we're slow, somebody's going to come to these ideas first? Not on the hardware point of view. I mean, I, I'd, been, I'd actually worked on some of the Symbian code back in, like, 98. I'd been contracting for Symbian. Where actually, Dave Tupman, my boss at Apple, actually turned out he was, like, five floors above me, and I didn't know him. He was doing hardware at, at Symbian at the time, at, at Scion. Um, 
But actually, you know, when, and, and I'd been a big phone nerd, as you could see, the number of phones I owned. I used to buy the latest release and go, this is the one, this is the one. It's going to be, oh, it's awful. Um, <laughs> sell it on eBay, buy another one. Um, and I'd been through all the different ones. And, and you looked at, no one was really pushing the boat out to what was possible. And so when, you know, came in, the specs we were doing, the, the, the speed of the processor, the size of the screen, we didn't, I didn't, you know, in the hardware team, we didn't really know. We knew it was multi-touch, but like, I, the first time I saw Pinch to Zoom was at the keynote. I didn't get to see it before then. <laughs> That's just amazing. Um, uh, you know, amazing. it's like, need to know. Does the yeah. touch screen work? Yes, we get touch events. Okay, you're, you're done. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, there was, there was a lot of stuff there, which was, you know, you looked at that stuff, and it was just like, it's obvious that everyone else was just, they had to make so many different variants of phone. There was just like incremental. They were holding stuff back. And Apple had nothing to hold back. It's just like, let's go for it. Yeah. What's the best stuff we can get? Let's add a bit to that and push all the chip vendors a bit harder and the bit screen vendors and everyone a bit harder and, and, and get this amazing thing. Um, and it was just Nokia was being incremental. Everyone was being incremental. Yeah. For me, it was more like the, like the gaming world seemed like it was starting to get it quicker than like the phone world did. Yeah. You know, back in the day, you look like I think Sony had like a, like a portable out that actually had some kind of like graphics that actually moved at something faster than 10 frames a second or something, right? And you could yeah. kind of see that and go like, you know, well, the hardware, somebody was, I mean, it was huge, but like, you know, somebody's able to make something that kind of does this for an hour <laughs> before it runs out of battery. Like it gave you some hope that we could pull off something yeah. cool. Yeah, that's kind of more like what was I happening with, with, with consoles. Sorry, with consoles were like, every time a console came out, like Sony would put so much stuff in the PS3, everyone would go, you can't possibly make money on that. There are so right. many chips in it. And it would work out in the end. But they had to, you always had to seriously, not one up, you had to two up the, the last console to be noticed. Yeah. And that's kind of, yeah. Anytime. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, yeah, yeah, you're right, that every, every single time a new phone came out, for me anyway, there, I, I had this hope that, okay, this was actually going to be the phone that I want to use. And they never were, and and it was, <laughs> it was because they were they were very incremental. Like you know, every, you know, it's a brand new year, and Sony Ericsson now they have this brand new phone, and you know, last year's was okay, but boy, they've done a year of learning. Let's see what they come out with now. <laughs> and one year later, it's about like what they had released a, a year. Except before. it would have like a special key that did something stupid on the side of it. Yeah, like, you know. <laughs> or, or, yeah. And it was slower than last year's and probably had slightly worse battery life yeah. and had this fuzzy screen that allegedly was color. And uh, you know, it was just, it was just <laughs> bad in, in all these ways. So. so it was waiting for disruption. <laughs> so what, one of the things I don't get about secrecy, I mean, you guys talk about, you were heavily compartmentalized inside is the sense I got. And it just seems to me that that would be an impediment to making things you know, interaction, right? It, obviously, there was some way around it, but wasn't, didn't you have to get over the walls to work together? Yeah, we, we did, and, and I, I, I'm, it was an impediment. Of, I mean, I, I think, of course, it was an impediment. Um, but, but at the same time, there was, there was it, at the same time, there was so much value there as well by having this secret and having it, having it be that, you know, let the whole, let the rest of the world think that, in order to develop a phone, you have to do this incremental thing, right? You know, and, th and that's what the industry looks like. And you know, everybody's going to have effectively a dot one, and they're going to take a, a whole year to, to come out with that. You know? um, I, I mean, I think that all served us very well in the end, that you know, nobody knew what was coming, and nobody knew what, what we were working on. You know? and, and if anybody had to guess, they would think that it looked probably a lot like the Blackberries did right. at that time, or the Trios did at that time. And they, you know, maybe. If you asked anybody, based on what had already been happening in the phone industry before, they would think that we were going to have a very minor increment on top of the best phone that, that was there in 2006, right? You know, because that was the pattern that everybody else was following. Yeah. So why would we have anything better? You know, and, and so, if, you know, that, that all, you know, I think those years of, of, you know, sort of slow development in the phone industry also helped us too. In addition to keeping it secret, it helped us really make a big splash. When Steve Jobs led the development of the Mac team, um, he basically created esprit de corps by convincing them they were pirates. They even, they even flew a pirate flag at one point. Did, was there anything, how did, what, what was the, you know, the chemistry that, that sort of motivated you? Was there anything like piracy or? <laughs> Do we pillage anything? <laughs> we, we pillaged employees. From we pillaged groups. employees. <laughs> pillaged a lot of I mean, I would say that's a, yeah. Engineers. That was as close as it came, is like we, we would go 
to build, so there's building two, which is kind of where we were, and then we would wander over to building three, which is kind of where a lot of other people were, you know, to hang out because we have like friends there and whatever, and then like, like little, like iChat storms would blow through that like, those people, they're in there, you know, they're over here poaching again, like, you know, managers would come out and like, you know. Right. <laughs> I, I would walk into building three and, and within just a couple of minutes, two or three managers are coming out and they're asking, you know, who are you talking to? You can't talk to him, we need him. You know? <laughs> because, they, yeah, I mean, obviously they knew that the, la the previous three conversations I had ended up with, you know, an employee getting yanked and, and pulled onto the, into the private area, in, we, into we, the secret area. Even yeah. in hardware, we got some best resources, like, you know, be like the best layer engineer. Yeah. We, get, oh, we got Doug, and it's like, oh, I'm sorry, guys, we got Doug. He's busy, he can't help you anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so there was there was tablet computing work going on at Apple, and yet you guys brought a phone to market first. Did I mean? Were, did you guys think tablet at all? I mean, did, was there anything to cannibalize? Did you? I mean, did multi-touch sort of emerge from tablet work to end up in the phone first? What, what was the history? I don't know. That's probably. Probably a Scott there. question. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have someone answer. Stay tuned for the exciting we'll, conclusion. We'll, we'll, we'll read. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, today it all seems so natural and obvious, but there are things in that interface that I've been told you guys like died over. Um, th you, you talked a little bit about seeing it first, seeing things scroll and seeing momentum. Yep. Or seeing, I mean, a pinch or um, what were the hardest things to do and when people look at their phones today what should they look at and say you know this is this was an innovation because now it's just like the air we breathe so I, I'll start with one I can't tell you how many how many times I heard Scott Forstall going into poor Andrew Platzer's office wherever he is <laughs> right over there <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's and, and also talking, not here. Talking about <laughs> the scrolling, the scrolling deceleration, the, 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 how, how the phone, while it's decelerating or while it's, while it's scrolling, when you touch, what is the, you know, what is the behavior of, of the screen at, at any of those moments? How should all of these, you know, just very, being very specific about the details around scrolling and, and just moving through a list and, and the whole UI and how it responds to touch. If, if you... You know, if you look at phones that, that uh, or if you look at any devices that were touched before the iPhone came out, there's really this feeling that you're, right. you know, that, you, that, that you're, you, you're wearing like three gloves and you're trying to hit these tiny little buttons. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it feels very detached. It feels like you're, you're pushing something that pushes something that pushes something. Whereas with, with the iPhone, it, it not only does it respond immediately, but, but it, it does in a very natural way. And there's a lot of freaking math <laughs> that, that goes into making it work that well. And, and, and a lot of those details, too. How much compute was there? Were you pushing the edge of the computing that was available to make that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. That nah, was OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, to, I mean, kind of the interesting path of it is like, so we got it working on a G5, which is like the biggest, the fastest thing we had. And we were pretty excited about that. <laughs> and then we got it working on a, like a blue and white G3. Right. And then we got it working on, and then Virgil figured out that you could super crap up uh, one of those orange iBooks and make it even slower, and we got it working on that. Right. <laughs> and every time you would optimize it, you would, different stuff would bubble to the top of being really, really slow. Um, and then what was interesting is then we started to transition over to kind of more real hardware, and you start to play with, for kind of our experience anyway, it was one of the an early times where, hey, we have this GPU that maybe isn't total garbage compared to like the CPU, which is like total garbage. Like, how do you optimize? I mean, sorry, it was probably great. Um, like, <laughs> you know, like it was the best you could get at the time. <laughs> it, it was. Um, but like, it, it you know, it started making us think like, okay, well, maybe the way to do this is not the you know the draw model that we had done on the desktop. Uh, you know, maybe like so like Harper and core animation and all that stuff came to, came, came to be where it was like, maybe we draw the, as much of this stuff as we can ahead of time and then let the GPU do its magic of like compositing everything. And once we kind of had that, it, 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 every time we moved to like a slower or close, a piece of hardware that was closer to what we were actually gonna have, we would have to kind of like re-architect things and make it faster and to the point finally where it, yeah, it, you know. So there was a Andrew GPU in the up. first iPhone? Yeah. I mean, there was actually a, 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 okay. a lim limited very limited. Lowercase G. Had yeah, yeah lowercase G. <laughs> um. And so the graphics all, 
all happened, the compute graphics all happened there at the end? The gist of the idea was that like, things like text drawing and all that stuff is just like notoriously slow. And so you do that like, on, this, on the CPU, and you basically build a layer, right? And then the, the, the GPU is really good at compositing um, compared to the CPU. And so the idea was that, like, OK, on the, you know, kind of get everything ready to go. Get the recipe for how you're going like, to composite this scene together. Do that on the CPU. And then let the GPU do the business of actually placing, you know, compositing where all those bits need to go. And then you're not sitting there redrawing all this stuff all the time, right? You can be taking your leisurely time at a 60th of a second to like, you know, you have a little more of the time. However long, it, however fast you're throwing it to go make the next layer so that you can then yeah. composite that. So it seems totally obvious and nobody noticed it at all, but the, when you reach the bottom, when you're browsing a page and you reach the bottom, it bounces. Yeah. Where did that, is that an idea and where did it come from? That's Mr. Uh, Boss. Mr. Boss. <laughs> Wait, now, so, am, am, am I, I mean, nobody thinks about it, but was that a big deal? I mean, was it, would you consider? I think it was a huge deal. Yeah, I mean, it was a big, yeah, I mean, a lot of people thought it, well, yeah, I think it was a big yeah. deal. Yeah. yeah. But it's part of the. <laughs> so, I'm being a little, you know, yeah. certain court systems think it was a big deal, so, yeah. you know. <laughs> 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 Just leave it at that. Yeah, yeah. So, so What's the story of the, um, did the icons kind of move over from dashboard? Was, I mean, what, what's the, the story of the, is that? I don't remember. Did they you, move over? Is that sort of the roots? Okay, we'll come, we'll come back to that. Yeah. <laughs> and how about, the, uh, is the, the, the homepage UIC, was that codenamed Spring, Springboard? Uh-huh. Did, is there a story behind? I thought they kind of bounced, and so they, <laughs> I thought it was a Springboard. Springboard oh, okay. was originally, like this thing that I wrote as a, a quickie thing, because we are we're starting to get all these like apps, and and in the demos that the HI guys had done, like they're always very, you know, it it sprung to life and it was all this other stuff and it, like our when we were showing our apps, once we finally had apps, like it seemed like it would be nice for them to do the same thing, and so we wrote I wrote like Springboard to just do that kind of thing, and then it kind of. Well, it also, hey, we need to be able to show the lock screen, or hey, we need, and it kind of organically grew, <laughs> <laughs> as all good architectures do, awesome. yeah. um, <laughs> into um, this thing where it's like, oh, no, no, this is like a fundamental like, you know, piece of the system. Um, and I think one of, the last, one of the last commits I did was actually to pull out the, there was a 700K ping that represented the Chrome for the, when we do demos, of like, of like some phone that never actually even existed. Um, and we, yeah, that out at the last minute. Yeah. So, um, did both? Did all of you guys, uh, or any of you, work on what was called P1, the effort to do a scroll wheel? Did did you go? Were you so, involved? So I, I arrived just after P1 had oh, died. So P1 was already gone. So I, I found stuff in my drawers. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, there's actually when we did the first board bring up, you know, the, there's there's stuff wasn't ready on the first process yet for, or, you know, wasn't yeah. quite there. So we had the original interface, and it actually had the touch screen, but you could do click wheel stuff on it. Yeah. So it rendered the UI on that. But there was a lot of stuff we were doing to check the hardware work before we passed it over to, to you know, the, the guys across the street who did all the, the, yeah. the Darwin stuff. So, yeah. But there was this sort of dueling hardware. Did, did you guys compete? Were you always on the P2 side? Is that the way it, the way it worked? Yeah. Well, it's funny because, yeah, there, I mean, there was definitely two teams and there was this you know, sort of rivalry or competition or what have you. But at the same time, we, on the software side, we, we actually developed some, some core components with the intent of sharing them with P1. Um, because we knew that so, some of these pieces, we, we wanted to make sure that they were road tested and they worked well when they, when, when they worked on, uh, when, when we eventually got to P2, as was plan of record at that time. So we actually went over and, and spoke to, uh, we met with the software team the P1 software team, and said, you guys need an address book. You're making a phone. <laughs> you probably need an address book. We're making one. We're making one that's very memory efficient and very small and compact. And we really want to make sure that our, as many of our components are, are working well as uh, up front as possible to, to kind of front load the work as much as we can, because we know that there's going to continue to be more and more work as we keep going. So let's try to qualify some of these core components early on. And one way we could do that is if P1 is the first boat that's leaving, then let's get our pieces on that boat uh, and, and make them uh, ship on P1 first. So anybody who knows about the address book API, 
And if you wonder why it's in C, and what the iOS team was thinking writing that first version in C, <laughs> it's P1. Okay. Years later, yeah. I would get all sorts yeah. of like, and, no. and, and why, is the, why is all this C garbage in here? What were you thinking? It's right. Like, well, it's, there was reason. And, and actually, the, the, radio, you know, the radio part was reused. So you know, different, different AP processor and stuff, but a lot of the radio design just came over, yeah. which is good. We had enough stuff to worry about on the first P2 on M68. Then, then we had enough stuff to worry about than, than having brand new radios as well. Yeah. We had that worry later. There was also an issue that had to be resolved. I mean, there was there was there was a Mac OS coming down um, from the top, and then there was a there was a time that people talked about an embedded OS coming up. Um, want anybody want to talk about sort of how you guys? I mean, did it become obvious at a certain point that that? Well, we I mean I don't know if this is kind of good now, but like in the very beginning, like we didn't really know like how capable this system is going to be. And so we spent a bunch of time in the really early beginnings, like in that early week where we're all like moving offices and stuff, like trying to figure out like, like how do you how do you render something? Is this, are we going to take AppKit and chop it all up? Are we going to take like you know I made a I took AppKit and like started chopping at it and I got like I think I removed my second or third bit of like two bit TIFF rendering from like 1987. I was like, even if we, <laughs> even if we, it's probably still there somewhere. Um, even if like we do this, it's we're not building a system that is, is it's it, that captures the heart and soul of this stuff that we're seeing. Um, and so we looked at like I did one in Core Foundation. It was kind of like a UI kit, but done with Core Foundation. And then I started like some of the early the early UI kit stuff where it was like this Objective-C kind of framework. And it was, I think, kind of clear that like that was the way to go. It was, I think it was, I don't, we probably should have been more scared about like how much work that was going to be for Platzer. Um, <laughs> but um, um, yeah. I think that's where we were at from it is, is find this nice middle layer um, and then start building, you know, from like sort of the foundation level up um, don't bring the whole Mac over, but just you know, start with what it takes to make the cool stuff that the HI guys were were doing. Um, you know, apps came later, but there was also this issue of whether you could actually use the browser as an application environment. And was was that was that was that a, a debate that ever actually? I mean, was it? There, there was definitely a debate, an internal debate about what what technology should we use? Should we use more web-centric technology for? Creating these apps because, you know, the web the web is grow the web is the web it's yeah. everywhere and and more and more people, you know, there was this thought that it, it would be easier to author apps if we if we opened up some web yeah. if we used a web tech you know web technologies and they people who were arguing for that side that was not me uh, were were saying that these things were getting better and better over over the years as well and so at some point. <laughs> and anything that you can do in native, you could pretty much do in, on, using web technologies, and we just need to be smart about it, and this is the right path going forward. Then there were other people who were saying, no, no forget all that, native, nothing beats native, nothing beats native compilation and running right on the bare metal, uh, and why are we, we're building a phone here. Why, are, why would we possibly entertain putting a web browser on a, it, it's already hard enough to implement the design as it is using native code. Why would we throw this, this, you know, this big ball of web in the middle of it as well? Yeah, um, a bag of web. And so, I'm sorry? <laughs> it's a bag of web. A bag of web in the <laughs> middle of it, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And um, some of us had like, we'd done dashboard like right then, like dashboard had come out not too soon before that, and I don't know, we'd done some of that, and. It was yeah. a challenge for me. Uh, 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 you know, Sorry, we're opening old wounds. Like, like, cause yeah. we did that, we did that, and it was sort of a little bit of, I don't know, I think it should be this way, and everybody had good points, and then we, we, did, we went away, and then everybody came together and made something cool. Apple had this other OS that was lying around called the Newton OS. Did it ever get any consideration? Uh, well, I, I think our, our designer at the time, lead yeah. designer, was Gre Greg Christie, who would formerly worked on Newton. Newton, yeah. so I don't think that anything was directly carried over from it, but at least we had that knowledge, yeah. uh, and and at least one other person uh, who who had roots in in the Newton as well, and yeah. you know could tell us war stories. So there was that, but there was never that this was old serious. treasure trove of code that we could go pull from, <laughs> and, uh, you know, build something great from the. There's, there's people who've seen an ARM processor before, though. Yeah, r yeah, that's so true. You probably yeah, which yeah. is well, I'm sorry. people who had a, I mean ARM processor, you know, it was, yeah. it was like oh yeah, well I can. You know, yeah. rendering can be done quite nicely. And yeah. Lots of fun stuff. Yeah. 
so the, the keyboard, um, even after you guys um, announced, I mean, it was, a, it was like a huge question mark, a huge gamble. Um, when did you guys sort of buy into the notion you could build a, a device without a physical keyboard? Well, I made the first crappy one that made everybody <laughs> consider, maybe this isn't going to work. Um, <laughs> why was it crappy? Uh, why was it crappy? That's a good question. I think because like, I had no business making a keyboard. Um, like back in the day, you look at it now, and it's like this beautiful machine learning problem, right? But then I was like, just this idiot, and I didn't, I was like, I knew what an n-gram was, which I thought was pretty cool, but not nearly cool enough. Um, and, um, but yeah, but then, we, we, uh, maybe we'll hear stories about that later, that we had like a, a competition, and really awesome ones came out of it, and so we, we shipped that. I think at some point, if, I, don't, I couldn't tell you when, it kind of felt like it wasn't as scary a thing. We were talking about, it's really hard to like, you could, that's one of those problems where you can then be really all in your head about it because it's like, well, like, on, on I type on this thing and it sucks. And if I type on a BlackBerry, maybe it's better. Um, and you, you can get in your head about, well, this, you know, this sucks and this is better. And when you're doing that math, you're not thinking about, well, that, yeah, but, but this phone does all of this other stuff that you can't even compare. Like, BlackBerry doesn't do any of that stuff. Um, you can get kind of like spun up about those kinds of problems and really kind of maybe not notice that, yeah, yeah but the overall picture is, is much, much better. We've got a ton of questions, a little bit of time, but I do want to ask one, one hardware question. While all this was going on, <laughs> um, you know, you were building the supply chain to China. And I mean, was that something that you were deeply involved in? And what was it like trying to set up a manufacturing operation in um, China? It's funny, you know, Apple was great at manufacturing already. You know, and they had a lot of the iPod people, the EPMs, EPSs, all the, all the stuff like that. I mean, it, for us working there, it was actually like all this was done for you. That was the, the great thing about working. It was like working for a startup with infinite resources, and you got top priority on everything. You know, you needed some new test gear, it arrived the next day. You know, when you design stuff, you got to pick the best chips for the best, make stuff work. Someone else would worry about cost. So it, I, it was always amazing. You know, we'd, we'd sort of fly to China and Everything, everything was organized. Everything would arrive. Processes would be like hand carried from from Korea over, and they'd, they'd arrive just as the SMT line started to move, sort of thing. And it was like, wow, someone's done a lot of organizing here. And I just turned up and like, you know, put power in and stuff smoked. Whoa, okay. <laughs> um, I'm glad I'm here to help. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> You know, there was, Apple already had this very mature manufacturing machine. You know, they, they hadn't made a phone before. They'd made lots of miniature stuff before. They'd built Wi-Fi radios before. Yeah. Sure, there were lots of different challenges, but Apple was incredible at, at designing and building it and managing that, that, that chain. I mean, there were some things we did new for the phone in terms of like a really connected manufacturing process, which was new, and there were a lot of, a lot of people lost a lot of hair over that. Um, making that work, yeah. but uh, it was great. You know, there was like there was like sovereign territory in the Foxconn office. There was like in, in the, it, there's an office which only Apple people could go into and had like direct DS3 lines from from Texas into it. And there is amazing things in the factory. How often did you go to China? Um, for the first phone, a lot, um, and and then I had kids. <laughs> and uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Apple, very nicely, my manager, let me not go as often. Yeah. Um, but I really did like going to China. I mean, China's an amazing place. I find manufacturing amazing. I find the fact that the way China works, nothing is wasted. You know, it's like if there's a room with no one in it, the lights are off. Often it's unheated and the lights are off. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes they unscrew every third light bulb. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of a, it, it's to see how efficient the world can be. You kind of go to China, you see efficiency yeah. because it means something there. And I think we get very insulated to that in the Western world slightly. That it yeah. I'm going to start this. I want to ask one last question. What was it like to sit in the audience at the launch during um, uh, Macworld? And, I, and were you guys nervous? What, what I still get, um, it's, it's, yeah, I still get just now. I just get like, you know, chills about it. There's this funny, there's a, there's a Red Hot Chili Pepper song that happens the moment we hit our high water mark. And when you hear that, when you hear it play, like, we know, I know we've hit our high water mark for memory, and we're not gonna, like, <laughs> screw up. It's like, and it's like, I can be just, like, all pissed off at something, and then that song will come on the radio, on the radio and it's like my, my blood pressure just drops, <laughs> like, you know. 
It, it was absolutely terrifying. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, uh, it, it was surreal to, to see Steve Jobs demoing the, the thing that you, you've been working on for, for so many years. But, but at the same time, remember the things that he was demoing were things that we had worked on. And so, you, you know, the terrifying part was just, okay, we know that we've been through these demos and we know that we've fixed a lot of bugs in here, but there's always that chance that, you're going to, that, that he's gonna hit some bug that nobody has ever seen before and he's gonna hit it on stage during the keynote and it's gonna be in one of the things that I'm responsible for. <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and so there's no amount of, of you know, making yourself feel better about that until, yeah. until the actual demo passes by uh, and, and you can breathe a little bit, but, but usually the, you know, then there's another uh, uh, app that's, that's about to be downloaded, or, or Steve goes into this grand finale yeah. at the very end, and, you know, and now we're all having heart attacks because he's using four different apps and doing five different things. And, uh, Some of it so to it the was, script, probably. It was a little terrifying. I had a diff different way. I, I'd, I'd worked on the video output board and the tethers connecting the thing. And For the demo. For the demo. And then yeah. there, there were four things on the thing, and one worked the whole way through software and hardware, but I knew the tether was only two meters long, and I was more than two meters away, so it couldn't hit me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I, I was kind of cool with the whole thing. It wasn't a problem. <laughs> I, I want to ask you guys one sort of future and a question. This has all been about the iPhone. But you know, now when I walk down the street in my home, my, in San Francisco where I live, fully half the people are looking at the palm of their hand. Yeah. I mean, really, walking down the street, it's just it's, it's stunning how you guys change the world that way. And at the same time, I always think this can't be the end of UI. There has to be something after this. You guys have any thoughts? I mean, for a while I thought it was certain it was going to be VR. Now I'm a little less certain that that's the next step. But do you see a way forward in any in any time anytime soon? I, I kind of think it's going to be ambient ambient intelligence. Essentially, you know, the surroundings will be intelligent and actively help you with your life. Yeah. Um, that's IoT. It's you know. Yeah. I I can't really guess at what it's going to be, but but I yeah I do it, I do feel like at some point UIs are going to go away. You know that, that it's that we're not going to be looking for you know graphical representations on this light up thing, yeah. you know whether it's sitting on a desk or you know in your hand or something. But I think, but at the same time, there, there's so much, so much information can be conveyed uh, through a UI or through you know through a screen that there, there's probably it, it's going to be hard to to come out with with something that's even better yeah. than than what we have today. Yeah, I don't think it'll be I don't think it'll be an all or nothing thing where it's like all of a sudden we'll be. <laughs> doing some things yeah. like I think there'll be yeah exactly I think there'll be things that are there's tasks that are really good for like displays and there'll be tasks that are really good for you know voice assistant kind of stuff and yeah. Um, yeah I think we'll just I think it'll just be ubiquitous as it w is what'll make it all work it's just like you won't have to think about it it'll just I'll go to the thing that yeah. you know helps me do this task the best okay we have a ton of questions I'm going to ask them quickly um, and one or both uh, are all answered. Uh, did you predict, forecast the app boom that would happen after the iPhone was released? If yes, what is the next boom? Well, let's, let's just start with, did, did any of you predict the app boom? Did you know that that was what was the iPhone was, platform was going to create? I did not. Uh, I did not. Apps were really sucky on Symbian, so. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I guess I kind of thought, it, I don't know. I, I know. I mean, there, early on there was, it's funny because early on when we, when we spoke about apps, kind of the, the apps that we would talk about were sort of the, 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 they were more professional in nature. Like I know we talked about Hippocrates a lot. And we talked about, you know, Hippocrates is this, yep. is this app that ran on Palm devices that doctors carried around and it has, it has a lot of medical information on it. And, and it became pretty clear pre pretty early after we, we had the, you know, sort of our, the way we addressed apps for, for iPhone 1.0 was to say, go use web, tech, web technologies, right? Go make the best web app you can and go, you know, go to your website and load it and we'll allow you, give you ways to bookmark things. And it wasn't great, but, but that was the answer. But it, it became pretty clear that there are use cases that we wanted to support, like something like Hippocrates, that uh, maybe it wouldn't really work. I mean, how is, how is that going to work offline, like in a hospital where there's probably poor cellular reception? Do you really yeah. want to be trying to ping a remote server when, when you're doing that? So, so I think early on, it started, in my mind anyway, it started as, as you know, we, we were just focusing on professional type apps, which is, it's such a funny thing to say now, especially when 
you know, the hundredth fart app came out on the store, you know, to, to think that a lot of it, a lot Some of, of them were pretty professional though. Made yeah. the platform, yeah. yeah. How, did you, how did you keep Samsung from knowing what you were doing? Actually, Samsung was in the building with us. Yeah, so, did we? You know, it was, <laughs> yeah. okay. they, they weren't allowed in, I mean, in the hardware, but they couldn't see any UI, but, yeah. you know, they, okay. they, had, they had the chips. Okay, so, yeah. that's a good answer. How many hardware prototypes were killed before the first launch of the first iPhone? Ooh, define killed. Uh, <laughs> we got through quite a lot of them, but no one wants to use the old ones. You know, Proto Zero, and when like EVT comes out, no, no, no one touches the Protos anymore. Technically, I think you're supposed to hit them with hammers and put them in the blue bins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Have, have, uh, have there been, uh, has, has that scroll wheel iPhone uh, uh, prototype P1 gotten out into the public? Are there pictures of it around? It's pretty much not showing up yet, has it? I think a lot of that early stuff like only ever shows up because of somebody's court something something, right? I don't know that. Yeah. Yeah. Is that like court discovery or something like that yeah. or a court case? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. What role did Steve Jobs play day to day on the iPhone? That's probably <laughs> a, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean making, you know, I, I I was certainly doing my best work because, like, he might be, sometimes was lurking around the corner. So, right. like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there was a time where, like, uh, there was a time where, I don't know, somebody, we had something, somebody wanted to change or whatever, and they, like, every 15 minutes, somebody was coming to me and being like, so, hey, no pressure, but Steve wants to see, blah. And, like, after about the fourth person, I think it was, like, Venkat or somebody was like, hey, Scott, and I, without looking, I was like, you know, he'll see it when it's effing ready. <laughs> and then I, and I turned and there's, so Johnny was there and I was like, oh no. <laughs> and then like, and then Steve's kind of just pops his head through the, my door frame. It's like, <laughs> it's okay. Like, <laughs> you know, we'll wait. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> we'll be ready. That's a fair amount of pressure. <laughs> what kind of impact could individual engineers have on features in the iPhone? Was it very top down? Uh, I don't think it was very top down. I mean, I, th I think a good idea was a good idea, and I think it could come come from anywhere. And I think, to management's credit, if if you had a good idea, uh, let's do it. Yeah. 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 So no, it was not top. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. there was a lot of top down, but it was not all top down yeah. by any stretch. Why did the iPhone successfully jumpstart the mobile computer industry instead of, for example, Palm's PDA? It's kind of a softball, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know, for me, I think it's just like, it's so, I mean, I don't, you know, it's so fluid. It's so, it's, it's, it's got this magical, I mean, going back to the, you know, the rubber banding thing, it just feels, it feels lightweight. It feels like just comfortable. And um, I mean, that's just from how it, you know, from how you use it and never mind how it, it's also this beautiful piece of, piece of hardware. Right. Um, I think it's just it, you know, it checked enough of the boxes that were better, and it did a bunch of things that the other stuff just didn't even do, um, you know. Well, and I think I think also the the internet helped as well. I mean, right. I think that that when when the the Palm device was was out, there there really wasn't much in the way of of uh, of, of an internet, and and especially the utility that that people. Uh, uh, you know, over the years, that you know, the utility of the internet was just growing and growing and growing. When you had a Palm, it was really this, you know, you sync with this computer and then you're off on this little island with your Palm device and then you go back and you sync with your computer again and now you have some slightly updated information. Right. So, so, I mean, I think it was both, both I think the desire to actually com connect to the open internet, um, but there was only that desire because there was enough utility in, in connecting to the internet that that uh, you wanted to actually do that, right? You didn't want to just, oh, I wonder what's on the Yahoo homepage right now, which is what also, you may have like, typed in 1996. Yeah. But is that really going to do anything for your, for your life, to improve right. your life if you could do that? And our web stuff was like, I mean, it was amazing. It is amazing. I, I mean, you, you sat there. I, yeah, you, you, you could have. I, I'm sure they had a web browser on that platform, but you wouldn't. You would just be, I'll go pick up a newspaper before I go deal with yeah. all of this stuff. I was going to say, I think one of the main things actually was, was previous to the iPhone, there was, it was data cost money and they charge you a lot for it. And then True. having the unlimited, it was like, oh, I'm paying for it anyway. I can do anything I want. 
Yeah. And so A, a real application platform that, that would, you wrote real code for. It was big enough that you could write proper, proper big engineered programs, not just like, how like, can I make this thing to fit into the RAM? Um, you had great graphics. You had memory. You had a fast processor for the time, but a big screen to drive. Um, but you had unlimited data. And I think yeah. that was absolutely crucial. You mean through Wi-Fi? Uh, no, 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 even, like, no, even on, it was unlimited. I mean, the early, the early phones iPhone. were... Like I think I don't know I think like I people still like have it. Get over two G. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me ask a couple a couple more questions. We're drawing it near the end of our first hour. What were early disagreements about design that Steve Jobs weighed into? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll we'll pass. Sure, on. there weren't any. Probably went great. <laughs> Okay, that's a more general one. Um, I'm so glad I have a front row seat for when Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Here's tandem questions. If you have to add one feature to the current version of iOS, what would it be? If you have to remove one feature from the current version of iOS, what would it be? <laughs> I want better text selection. Yeah. I want better, I feel like a big, word, people seem to be chasing sort of this proness, and I feel like what's, What's missing is just doing sort of fiddly delicate things. I don't know what that looks like. I don't have a, an answer, but it's like, I feel like if you made it easier to do some of that stuff, that would be pretty yeah. great. Scott talked about um, interactions with Steve Jobs. Do either of you remember interactions, particular interactions with Steve? The, the one that sticks out in my mind that's sim similar to, to Scott's story was, uh, so we were in this lockdown area and uh, we had this couch that was right outside of my office. And because we were in this lockdown area, it was pretty easy to just talk freely. And, you know, and, and it wasn't a, you know, you, people were eating or complaining about some bug or th talking about how to fix something or what have you. And it wasn't uncommon for people to be sitting there and, and just chatting uh, while I was in my office. And, you know, I'd poke back out and talk, go back in, do a little bit of work, you know, kind of do, do this thing back and forth. One night, uh, so, so we're doing this. There are, there are two or three people sitting on that, on, on that sofa, uh, and we're just shooting, shooting the breeze like we, like we normally do. And all of a sudden, it got really quiet. Uh, but I heard, I heard you know, some the guys on my team who were sitting on the sofa, but they were talking very quietly. And, they were, and, and the way that they were talking was, it was as if they were telling somebody where somebody else was sitting. And to me, it all, it all just struck me as very odd. You know, I, was, I had been beavering away on my computer, and, but I was listening to this. And a couple times I said, who, who is that? They shouldn't be, anybody who is in this area should know everybody who, you know, everybody who's in this area. Like, this doesn't make any sense. Why would somebody be asking where, if you're in the lockdown, you should already know where you're going, yeah. right? Was kind of my thinking. And so I turn around to come out and say, like, who the, who the hell is, what, what's going on here? And, of course, Steve Jobs is standing there. <laughs> uh, and so it, and I think I did, you know, out, I think I, you know, actually did say, whoa, you know, <laughs> <laughs> before answering, where, you know, the... And then who are you? Obviously. <laughs> 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 before walking him down the hall to the person's office who he was looking for, so... Do you have any Steve memories? Uh, I didn't have many direct interactions. I mean, I, I had, there was one request that came through. My manager was, was on the first one. We were, they were thinking, they loved the, the board. They thought it was really pretty. They wanted maybe, they were gonna have it in the, they were gonna show the PCB, which was the first time ever to show, and there was a request about moving the CPU a couple of millimeters to the left to make it symmetrical. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it was, but it was with a proviso of, this is not gonna happen really, because I'm sure it's there for a, a real reason. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like the PMU took the other route, anyway. <laughs> but but uh, th there was a, a tiny bit of that, um, and we had a, a bit of this wasn't a Steve Jobs bit on, on the on the uh, on the iPhone four when they, they had the pretty picture of the that they did show the PCB and they had the A four processor, except they'd labeled the PMU because the processor was on the other side of the board, <laughs> and it was like it's much bigger than that. And it, but you know we engineers were laughing about this. It was a beautiful, beautifully done photo though. I'd say very nice photo. <laughs> Markup okay, always I, does an awesome job of that stuff where it's like you work on something and then they'll come up with some just amazing, beautiful animation for, I remember the original website that had like for how our sensors work. And I was like, that just looks like the goddamn future. Like what is going on up there, <laughs> you know? So uh, a, a final question. It's a little bit of a softball, but it's, it's uh, at the time, did you, and I'll say, did you think we'd still be using iPhones today? 
at the time of launch? How confident you were you were you were creating a platform that was going to be one of the major platforms of modern? I thought computing? it was. I thought it was pretty cool. I guess the thing that I've noticed is it just it feels like the 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 pace of these things is getting faster and faster and faster. So it's like I don't know. We you know classic kind of lasted this chunk of time, and then Mac OS X, and it seems like we the next thing kind of comes like faster and faster and faster, and I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I don't know what it is. I'm excited for whatever, yeah. you know, replaces this thing. You know, I, I wasn't I wasn't sure of the iPhone's future. At, you know, even even despite this this big splash and and uh, and and the great reception it received, th there are so many stories in technology about either great technology or a really cool product that's just killed for some other reason. You know, it's either priced too high or it's, you know, it doesn't solve some critical problem that, you know, some customer base needs or it's too early to market or it's too late or, you know, usually it's too early. You know, th those types of things that, that it wasn't, even though we, we had what I, something that I was just so proud of and, and, and was just something that I personally wanted to use in the worst way, it still wasn't, cl you know, clear to me that this was going to be a commercial success. I, I still hadn't completely bought off on it, probably not until the iPhone 4, probably not until the Verizon deal. Uh, that, that was sort of the first time that it felt like, okay, this thing actually, people, people still want it. It's not just the hardcore Apple, you know, the, the, the Apple fans who, who are going to buy this and then nobody else, right? It, it, that was, at that point, it sort of, it started to feel more like, okay, this is really, this is going to, going to be around in 10 years yeah. even, you know. I think just, just seeing people use it when you had got the first one, when you could actually give it to people, they could yeah. touch it. Yeah. Um, seeing the look on their faces and how they interacted with it, it was just like, well, this is the future. I was just hoping that Apple wasn't going to be the niche provider of it, you know, with the stuff for the, the people who yeah. really like good stuff. Right. And, and, right. You know, and it, it's still, the, it's not the majority of phones out there, but it's, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think it, it did inspire a lot of stuff. Okay, at this point, we're going to have a short video intermission, but please join me in giving a hand to Hugo and Nitan and Scott. <laughs>